Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6. So he said to me, this is the wor word of the Lord, said uh, to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And then Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yield its root in season, and uh, whose leaves does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff, that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Father, our hearts are always sad when we hear of families that have suffered loss of loved ones. And Lord, it's a difficult time for them. We pray for his dear wife. We pray for the children that are involved in this. And Lord, their hearts are hurting. Uh, we pray that as the family gathers together, they would sense your presence. They'd know your comfort. I pray for David and Nadine, Lord, with their sense of loss, and that, Lord, as believers, you'd help them to be a, a real comfort to this family. You'd give them the right words to say, the encouragement to share with, Lord, the children and, and the wife at this time. And we pray, Father, that uh, you just superintend in this difficult days, they'd sense your glorious presence. Father, as we meet here tonight... We thank you that we come together in that glorious, precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who means so much to us who know him, the one who has saved our souls and changed our lives. And I pray, Father, that you be pleased to guide us again tonight into your truth. Lord, again, I need your filling, and I need your help. I need your physical strength, and I need your mental strength, and I need the spiritual strength. So I call upon you, and I pray that, Lord, you would draw those that you brought into this place tonight to come with an eager mind to hear your truth, to see how they might apply it in their own lives, and begin to experience in a fresh new way the power of the living Christ within. We'll thank you for what you will do and accomplish in Christ's name. Amen. If you are here for the first time tonight, I, uh, I will in some ways apologize, but I don't apologize. This is part 10 of a series called Christian Counseling, where we have been going step by step, trying to show you how to find victory over the hurts and habits and hang-ups and things that are in your lives, that addictions and all of those kind of things that can really hurt you and keep you from growing spiritually in the Lord. And uh, to compound that, we finished last Sunday night right in the middle of a message because we ran out of time. And uh, I hate starting in the middle of a message because I'm not going to take the time to go back and review it all for you. But uh, we're talking in all of those steps, and we've listed them all out, but I won't do that for you this evening. The last Sunday night step was repairing relationships because most of the problems that we have in life and the and whether we realize it or not, a lot of the things that we get addicted to and wrong habits that we develop in our lives and the hurts come from the relationships that we have in life. And a lot of those relationships have gone haywire. <laughs> They've gone wrong, and, and they cause us to react in wrong ways and influence us and impact us in ways that sometimes we're not even aware of in life. And last Sunday evening, we're, we're talking about that step is to evaluate the relationships that I have in life. Just take a sane look at them and say, where am I in my relationships in life? And one of the keys to that is being willing to forgive all those that have hurt me in some way. How many of you find that hard sometimes? <laughs> right? Come on, I'll be honest. There's more of you than that, I'll guarantee you, Right? We struggle with that sometimes. And we asked the question last night, why in the world should I 
Why should I forgive somebody? Why shouldn't I be out to have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? And, you know, we can find a scripture in the Old Testament that alludes to that, which most people totally misunderstand. But forgiving, why should I forgive? Number one, because God's forgiven me a whole lot of things. (laughs) He's forgiven me more than I would ever have to forget anybody else in my life. I have so sinned against God in thought and word and deed in so many ways, and some things over and over and over again. Now, I know I'm the only person like that here, but, but pray for me, all right? Not only because God's forgiven me, but because harboring resentment and anger and bitterness and hurt in my heart, have you figured out yet? It just doesn't work. It doesn't do a one thing to change that person. All it does is hurts me greatly. I walk around with this in my mind, in my heart. Every time somebody mentions this person's name, I, I want to fly off the handle, and, and it just hurts me. It's, we said three things about that. It's unreasonable. It's unhealthy. It hurts us physically. And, and it, it's just damaging to us in so many ways. It's just totally unhelpful, un, unhealthy to all of us. And then we said the re- third reason we need to forgive is because whether you figured this out or not yet, somewhere down the road, you're going to be in need of forgiveness because you're going to hurt somebody. And especially, all of us are going to do something against God. Is that right? We're going to sin. And when you sin, what do you need? You need forgiveness. But what has God said? He taught us to pray. Father, forgive us our trespasses as what? Oh, why do you have to say that? As we forgive others. Yeah, which requires me to be willing to forgive others. And if I'm not willing to forgive others, neither can God forgive me. And I need to be in a right relationship with him. So, I'm going to need to call upon that forgiveness. And if I'm going to need to call on that forgiveness for my own sake, I need to what? I need to forgive those that have hurt me and done wrong to me in my life. And as we finish last Sunday night, we're just coming to the part where we're talking about how do I go about that? Well, step number one of that is I need to reveal my own hurt. In some ways, I need to reveal it to myself. I need to admit to myself how much what this person did to me hurt me. I need to acknowledge that. I need to admit it, that it's, it's a reality. I need to face it. I need to put it out in the open. I need to be honest about it. I don't think that you're going to get over your hurt until you admit your hurt. And bring that hurt to God and say, God, this is what it's done. This is what I'm experiencing. This is the torture. It's going to be hard to find God's help, God's healing, and God's peace in your life until you can lay that out before the Lord and express it to to God. So, bring it to Him. Sometimes I'll talk with somebody who said, well, you know, I I guess I'll have to forgive them because, well, I, I know they did the best they could. No, they didn't. I'm going to shock you tonight. But my parents didn't do the best they could with me. Let me give you another shock. I didn't do the best I could with my kids. Because none of us do the best we could because we're all sinners and we all fall short. You understand that? We're not the best parents in the world. We failed in a number of areas in raising our children. Thank God for His grace where He enables them to forgive us and He moves in to give them the strength to carry on, right? And to become what God wanted them to become even though I wasn't everything I should have been. And what I'm saying here when I say this is we need to admit what was done wrong to us and not create a bunch of excuses. Well, because of this and that or yeah, they did the best they could and all this. No, we just need to say, they did this, this person did this in my life, they hurt me in this way, God, here's how it is. Don't, don't approach it with a sense or spirit of denial. Admit it. Until you admit it, that nobody could do the best they could, it's hard to get treated by the power of God to overcome that in your life. You can't forgive 
what you won't own up to as the pain in your life. And when you come to face it, yes, this is what they said, this is what they did, this is the way it hurt me. It's amazing how that God can then at that point begin to move us on to say, you know what, God, I want to release that person. I want to forgive them for what they've done to me and begin to turn this over to God. But first, we've got to admit there were some people that hurt us. Anybody here have some people you could think of tonight that hurt you? Man, you, you're just this wonderful spiritual congregation. Nobody's ever hurt you. I could list quite a few. Matter of fact, I thought I'd list some from this congregation tonight. <laughs> You've heard me say this before, but get a sheet of paper and make the list. Write it down. Be absolutely honest. Just ask God, Lord, would you bring situations, people to my mind that have hurt me? It might begin with your wife, your husband. It might be a teacher that said something to you or did something to you in school. I don't know what it is, but it's there, and you need to come face-to-face with that thing. What they said, uh, what you thought when they said it, what they did to you. Somebody just put it this way. There is no closure without disclosure. No closure in your life until there's disclosure, getting it out there and facing what happened to you. Maybe it was a youth worker, a youth pastor somewhere that said, you know what, son, you are never going to amount to anything. Maybe you went to him and said, I think God wants me to be a pastor. And he looked at you, you will never be a pastor. By the way, you know, I have a pastor in my past that said of me, he will never make it. He'll never be a pastor. I decided to be a pastor just to prove them wrong. (laughs) I'm a pastor because God called me to it. I've been a pastor for 40 years, so I guess he was wrong. And I got to tell you, when I first heard he said that, I was what? I was hurt in there. Can I tell you, I'm not hurt by that anymore. What did I have to do? I had to acknowledge that it did hurt, and then I had to release him and give forgiveness for that from my own heart before the Lord. That's the second step here, reveal my hurt and then release the offender. You have to let them go. You can't continue to hold on to it in your heart so it, it, it just reinvents it and goes over it again and again every time the name is mentioned or Satan or somebody brings it to your mind and it tortures you and it hurts you greatly. You must learn to forgive. In Matthew chapter 18, And it's a great chapter there on, you know, if somebody's offended you, you go and you talk to them, and if you won't listen to that, you take somebody else, and if that doesn't deal with it, you take to the church. And then Jesus goes on, and he tells this story about this guy that that he owed the, the king this huge debt, thousands upon thousands of dollars, and when he found out, he what? He forgave him all that debt. And then that guy went out and found a guy that owed him a few pennies, And he, he what? He didn't forgive him. He says, you pay up or I'm going to put you in jail. And what many of us forget is at the end of that story, it says that the king brought that guy back and said, okay, because you are unwilling to forgive, I am going to deliver you to who? I'm going to deliver you to who? The Bible says the tormentors, the torturers. And what I want you to understand from that, and I can't go into it all tonight because we really don't have the time to do that. We'll come back and preach through it sometime. (laughs) But when you refuse to let somebody go and release the hurt and the hatred and bitterness, it's resentment that's been building up in your heart, what God says in that passage is that you open yourself up to the tortures, the tormentors, to come and torture you. And some of you have been experiencing that in your life, the torment of that over and over because you've opened the door. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, I think it's down in verse 27, it's talking about this whole matter of forgiveness and so on, and it says this, neither give place to the devil. Think about that for a moment. Do you want to give place, some place in your heart, in your life, 
to the devil where he can come into regularly and work against you and trip you up and mess you up in your life. It's like you own 100 acres of land and you sell the devil one acre right in the middle of it. And when you give somebody an acre in the middle of it, what do you have to give them? A right of way to go in and out to it, all right? And what Satan does every day when he's driving in and out from his one acre that you've given him place in your heart is he throws his garbage all over the place as he's driving in and out. He throws his darts of doubt and fear and discouragement and all of his weapons. He's able to unleash from within because you give him a place in your life. And one of the great ways that you give him a place in your life is when you're unwilling to do what? to forgive. So when you don't forgive, who does it hurt? It generally doesn't hurt much the guy that you're not forgiving because he generally doesn't even know about it and he doesn't care. He might even take the light out of it that he bothered you that bad. But I'll tell you what, it hurts you and it will damage you and it will hold you back spiritually. A number of years ago, I was driving in my car when a preacher on the radio began to tell a story about an, a lady named Judy. I pulled over and wrote it down at the time. She was going through a messy divorce, and she was so angry and stressed by what was going on and bitter at her husband and things that had happened in her life. And, and the result of all of that is that she began to go blind in one of her eyes. And she went to see the eye doctor, and, and they looked at it at an eye clinic, and, and they said, uh, your eye is deteriorating rapidly. And unfortunately, there, there doesn't seem to be a thing that we can do about that to help you. She's carrying all this resentment and bitterness, and one day she just was driving by a church, and she thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go there this Sunday. So that Sunday she went to that church, and <laughs> As God often works it out, what do you think the preacher was preaching on that Sunday? He was preaching on resentment and the need for forgiveness. And he preached on, on resentment, and he said, for your own sake, you've got to let it go. You've got to release the offenders no matter what they've done. Don't allow people from your past to continue to hurt you in your present through the resentment. Let it go. Don't let them attack your heart every single day. Judy at first sat in the pew and said she clenched her jaw, thinking no. And slowly she bowed her head and she said this, Dear God, he really hurt me. He's wronged me in so many ways. But today I release According to this pastor, I don't think he's one of those psycho guys that you hear sometimes. Solid fella. Judy left the church service after talking with the pastor, went out into the parking lot as she walked to her car. She suddenly realized she could see perfectly with this eye. She went to the eye doctor, <laughs> had him examine it. He said, this is impossible. You are absolutely blind in that eye. This is a miracle. You know what I think it was? I think it was God saying, you've been willing to commit yourself to my truth, and you've released him, and so I want to do a miracle in your life. Now, I'm not going to tell you if you've got eye problems and you forgive everybody, you're going to get your sight back. But I do know this, it's a tremendous source of healing for you when you're willing to let the offender go and release them and trust God with this situation. Let it go. Well, then the question becomes, how many times? Do you have some people that just rub you the wrong way many times? Like over and over and over? How many times do you have to forgive them? Peter asked the Lord, he said, Lord, <laughs> would seven be enough? Do you remember what the Lord said to him? Peter, think more in the range of 70 times 7. 70 times 7. Got to forgive him. Now, I'm not going to try and exegete that for you tonight, but one of the things I think that means is this. 
when people hurt us, and God convicts me because I'm getting bitter in my heart, and I'm beginning to give place to the devil, and I don't want to do that, to get on my knees and release that person. And I do it. How many of you have ever done that, and, and maybe not the next day or the next day, but maybe a week down the road, just out of the blue, somebody mentioned this person's name, and all of a sudden, what happened all over again? All that fire just seemed to light up in your heart again. And what do you have to do? As part of the 70 times 7, you've got to get on your knees again and do what? Release them again. By the way, there are some people you're going to have to do that with how many times? 300 times? 400 times? And every time you do it, listen, it does something for you, for you. And there's just some of those things that Satan will try, think, try to stir up in our minds again, and we just need continually to get on our knees and say, dear God, I want to let this go. I, I want to truly give this person my forgiveness. You think God would be in favor of helping us do that? When we what? When we come to God with a willingness to let that go and release the hurt that's in our heart, the anger and the bitterness that's been growing inside of us. How often do you have to release the offender? As often as it takes to get it out of your heart, to get to the place when, when you think of that person, you're no longer angry, to get to the place that when you get on your knees and you go to prayer, you can actually pray for God's blessing in their life. That's when you know you've forgiven them. When you can get to the place where you can say, Lord, I know they've wronged me, and I don't know what the reasons were for all of that, and I don't know what's going on in their life, but Lord, I just pray, Lord, would you bring them to really know you? Lord, so that you could help them to change their life and the things that they do, and pray for God's blessing upon their lives. That's when you've really gotten to the place where you're releasing that person, where you have forgiven that person, and you can pray for God's blessing upon them. There's something that always helps me when it comes to try and release the people that hurt me in my life. And it's something I heard a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. And it's this, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. The people in your life are hurting you generally because what? Somebody somewheres hurt them in a relationship of life. You know what you get to do? You get to put a, a stop to that. You're going to say, we're not going to let this continue on and on and affect this generation and this generation and affect me and my kids and their kids. I want to do what? I want to stop it right here by being willing to offer forgiveness in the power of the Lord. You can't do it in your own strength. It's not by might nor by power, but by what? But by my, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And we need to call upon God's strength to do that. Now, somebody says, but how do you forget? How do you forget that messy divorce? How do you forget that physical or sexual abuse or sometimes verbal abuse is so painful? How do you get out? How do you how do you do that? You don't forget. But you must forgive. You must forgive. Don't go back and revisit it. Don't replay it in your mind. You must let go. And I want to tell you this, you can get rid of the pain because God's in the healing business and He wants to set you free from that pain that binds you. Now, when you forgive somebody, how do you do that? I want to tell you there's some situations where it's probably not wise to go back and tell that person or even make the contact with them again. And uh, If I had more time, I'd, I'd delve into that a little bit more tonight. But if you can't go to that person, it might not even be safe for you to go to that person. Something that you can do is just put an empty chair, one facing another. You sit in one, look at the other one, and just as if you're talking with that person, you just say, you know what, I know you hurt me, you did this to me, this is what it did to me, this is how I felt, this was the pain I felt, but tonight I am releasing you. 
in the power of Jesus Christ, I release you. And you, I think you're going to be amazed with what that can do in your life. It might mean you'll have to get to the 300th time before you find that full release yourself. But I want to encourage you to walk down that pathway and, and give the release. And then the third thing I want to say to you is learn to replace your hurt with God's peace. I love that verse in Colossians that says this, let the peace of God rule in your heart. It's an interesting word. It starts with there. It says let. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. In other words, it seems like I could stop the peace of God from ruling in my heart, right? One of the ways I stop the peace of God from ruling in my heart is being unwilling to do what God tells me to do. And when God says that I need to release the offender, I need to be willing to forgive. And I need to do that for all those reasons. You know, I don't want to give place to the devil. I don't want to be cast over to the tormentors that are torment me in my heart and my mind and all of those things. And so I must come to the place where I say, you know what, Lord? Your peace is more valuable to me than all the thoughts of vengeance and revenge and everything else that I could ever carry out against that person. And I am now at the place where I'm willing to release them because I want your peace to rule in my heart. Some of you tonight, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but you need, you need the peace of God ruling in your heart. You don't have that peace. You're not experiencing the joy of the Lord and the victory of the Lord in your life because you're hanging on to things that God has taught us in the Word that we must let go. Now, when we talk about dealing with these things in our minds, we've only talked about half the equation. We've talked about what do we do with people that have offended us? But I know a little something about people in this church. I know something about myself. I know that there are people here that you've hurt others. It's not just that people hurt you. Sometimes we do what? We hurt other people by the things we say, by the things that we do. We discourage people. We hurt people. We, we're thoughtless and careless. We're mean and we're cruel at times by what we say to other people. And God says... I want that dealt with too. If you want to have a right relationship with me, you want to begin to experience victory in your relationships, you've, you've got to make amends to some people that you have hurt and you've offended. And they're carrying a grudge in their heart and you're allowing bitterness to build up in their heart and maybe opening them, them up to Satan's attack. Why? Because you've not dealt with this from your point of going and making things right in their lives. I can tell you that the root of many of your problems is unresolved relationships that you are unwilling to make right before God. Some of you are going to ask me tonight, is this an absolutely necessary step? Absolutely. It's a necessary step. Don't think, you know what, I think I'll skip this one. You skip this one and you're going to be ending up in defeat because you're opening yourself up to Satan, to the tormentors, and you're going to be in such Misery, you're going to try to find some way outside of Christ to satisfy that need in your life, and you're going to end up with a habit, a hurt, an addiction that's going to mess up your life. So you need to bring it to God and deal with it before the Lord. Listen to this verse, if you will. We're going to come to it in our study of Hebrews on Sunday morning, but in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, it says this, looking diligently, it's like, watch out, get your eyes open lest any man fail of the grace of God. Fail of the grace of God, to let the grace of God work in you the way that God wants to work in you. Then it goes on to say this, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness. Bitterness over what? Where do you get roots of bitterness? Over things that people did to me, said to me, in relationships of life. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now listen, don't stop there. Trouble you and thereby many be defiled. You know how it is when somebody in this church even gets upset over something that was done or not done or they were neglected or whatever 
and they get this little bit of the thing going on in their heart, and then what do they do? They get on the phone. They get on Facebook. They, they, they talk to somebody over a coffee. Hey, I can't believe, you know what that Pastor Woodcock said to me? I can't believe it. And then they go and they tell somebody, and then they tell somebody, and they tell somebody, and before you know it, many people have been what? Defiled. Because we weren't willing to deal with things in a biblical way from our own hearts. We allowed bitterness to build up, and we caused problems in the body of Christ. Now, I'm thankful I can say, I don't know of any situation like that tonight. So, I can say that, right? If I did know of it, I probably wouldn't say what I just said. But it happens in churches. It happens in our lives. And we need to learn that we've got to get over these hurts that ruin our relationships and not just hurt us, they hurt what? They hurt the people in our lives. My dad taught me so many good lessons. He was just a, a great guy. He was in business with a gentleman and found out that that particular gentleman who happened to profess to be a Christian was cheating him out of a lot of money. And my dad walked away without a word. And can I tell you this? I can't say this about my mom, <laughs> but my dad never mentioned that to me again. He never talked evil or mad or angry at that person. Not ever. What a tremendous lesson to me. Because if he had of, what might have happened in my heart? I'd have grown angry and bitter at those people. And then I'd have told Joanna about it, and if she ever heard their name, she'd have been angry at them, right? Because that's the way we are. We let it spread and carry on. And God says, I don't want that to happen. I want it to stop. You must release the offender. You must make amends with those that you have wronged in your life because you make other people bitter, and then they defile many people in their walk of life. How do I do that? <laughs> Make a list. Make a list of people that you have offended, that you have hurt. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Can't think of a single person. You are so saintly. Would you come up here and finish this message? L let me give you a little bit of hurt and, or help, rather, in making your list. Ask yourself, is there anybody to whom I owe a debt that I have not repaid it? Now, if you owe somebody a debt, what are the chances that there's somebody somewhere that's stewing over that in their mind and in their heart? Have you ever broken a promise? You told somebody, I'll do this, I promise you, and then you've what? You just totally forgot it. Are you guilty of being over-controlling in other people's lives? Are you a manipulator? Well, you've manipulated people into do things and you make them feel guilty and you did it in a wrongful way. Is there a spouse or a child, an employee? Have you been hypercritical of people when you really had no right to be critical? Have you ever found out that a lot of times people, when they criticize you about something, if you watch their life, you find out that's the very thing that they struggle with? We tend to have our focus drawn to that, and we see it in everybody else, but we don't see it in ourselves. Have you been verbally abusive to people? Well, the way that you talk to them, things that you've said are physically or emotionally abusive. Have you been unfaithful in some way, in some relationship? Have you lied to people and deceived people? Well, if you've done that, what do you need to do? Get it on a list. Get it on a list. Now, what do you do with the list? What do I do about this? Uh, you need to think about how would I want others to deal with this if I'm on that end of it. You need to ask yourself, <laughs> how would I want others to make amends to me in my life? Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So, how would you have them do unto you in this situation? 
By the way, the verse for that is Luke chapter 6, verse 31. There's three issues I want to just touch on very quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 6 says that there's a right time and a right way to do everything. One translation says, to every purpose there's a time and a judgment. There's a time and there's a way to deal with it. So, if you're going to make amends and you're going to try to set things right in, in relationships in life, What's he trying to tell us there? He's saying, pick the right time. You know, the right time generally isn't if you want to pick something with your husband, you want to try and set something straight. The time to enter into that is probably not when you're sitting down at the table. Many a meal has been ruined because somebody drops the bomb, right? And then nobody feels like finishing the meal at that point. So, let's pick the right time. Listen, the right time for them, not you. It's not being selfish, looking at, well, I need to get this off my chest right now. No, it's the right time. You, you know, the wrong time is probably if your husband and wife and, and you're crawling into bed and he's just put his head on the pillow, that's probably not the best time to try and deal with that, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said Amen. <laughs> <laughs> be fair with people treat them deal with it at the right time a time when you know they're going to be able to deal with this and talk with you and and not have a bunch of people around so you're trying to embarrass them about the situation and so on but do it in their time the right time do it with the right attitude what's the right attitude ephesians tells us to speak the truth in Love, that is in a spirit of love, with an attitude of love because you care about that person and you want to make this amend in their life and so you're going to speak the truth but do it in love. How would I want somebody to come to me and speak to me in love? If somebody's going to come and apologize because they did something wrong to you, Sean, how do you want them to come to you? How do you want them to come to you, Graham? Well, yeah, I did that, but, but you did this. And you said that, and that made me mad, and that's why I said that. So, in essence, you're coming to apologize, but what do you end up doing? It's really your fault. <laughs> no, if you're going to make amends, you need to think this through, and you need to come determined to come, number one, with a spirit of humility, a humbleness, that you're looking not at what the other person may or may not have done wrong, but what you did wrong. And not come and say, well, yeah, I, I did that but. Leave the buts home. Just come and say, you're right. And I hurt you. I gossiped about you. I said things that weren't true about you because I was angry or whatever it was. And you get it out and, and you come with the right attitude of humility and sincerity. Don't bother even trying until you come sincerely sorry for what you've done and your part in what's taken place. Sincerely apologizing for what has happened. Acknowledging exactly what you did wrong. I don't know what it is, but it does something when a guy has thought about it enough and he's put himself in my place and he knows exactly what he's done wrong to me. Do you understand that? It makes a difference when he approaches me in that way. And it makes it easier for me to offer what? Forgiveness, which is what needs to take place if we're going to make things right in our relationships. So we need to do that. Whenever you start making a justification, whenever you begin to make excuses, well, I know I did that, but you know, this is what happened in my home, and that's the way my parents raised me, and I didn't know any better. And does that come across like real sincere? <laughs> like they're really sorry for what they did or what are they doing? They're putting blame over here and blame over here and blame over there, but they're not taking responsibility themselves. If you're going to make amends, what do you need to do? You just need to acknowledge your part, what you've done, what you've said, the hurt, the wrong that you've done in somebody else's life. If you have borrowed something... <laughs> and never took it back. How do you make amends? Take it back. Wow, what a novel idea. 
We are talking about this on Wednesday night in prayer meeting. If you borrowed something and you broke it, how do you make amends? You get it fixed or you buy a new one. And you take it back because you're accountable, you're responsible. That's a Christian thing to do, right? So if you got some people out there, you're one of those that's a borrower, but you don't return much. Some of you need to load up the truck and take it back. Just take it back. Make it right. It'll do something for you, but it'll also do something for the person that you've offended, that you need to make amends with in life. Do that in life. If you've spoken words that have wounded, go to that person. Tell them you know what you said, and you know it was hurtful, and it was wrong, and that you've repented before God, but you know it's also you want you want to come to them and, and say, I, I don't even expect you to forgive me. I don't know how to even ask you to forgive me because what I said, it was awful. Come with a, what? a sincere heart, a sincere heart before the Lord. Why do that? Because you will be amazed... You'll be amazed at how making amends sets you free and gives you confidence that you can call upon the power of God in your life in areas where you need God to work in you, right? But as long as you know there's things that aren't right and you haven't dealt with it, you'll always have a doubt when you come to God, I, I don't know whether God would hear me or not. And, all those kinds of things, because you haven't made it right. You haven't done what God's already taught you to do. Now, having said that, I understand there's some things you're not going to be able to undo. And the more serious things you've done, the more likely it is that you can't undo it. But you need to make the attempt where it's possible to do that. You need to make the effort. Don't ever underestimate the power of sincere humble apology in somebody's life to help them have a different view, maybe of the church, maybe of God. Who knows what it's going to do? You need to ask yourself when you're thinking about making amends, oh, I'm thinking about doing this. You need to ask yourself, is it appropriate? Is it an appropriate thing for me to do at this point? Proverbs 12, 18 says this, There is one that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. Do you know some of those people? They talk, and when they talk, it just pierces you like a sword. It really hurts. It cuts. But it goes on to say, There's one that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. In other words, a wise tongue, guided by the Spirit of God, can bring about health, healing, healing in relationships, in life, and that's what God wants us to do. And it'll do wonders in your marriage when you as a husband and wife put this into practice. It'll do wonders in your ability to raise your children when you put it into practice with your children. Don't tell me none of you parents have ever said anything or done anything wrong in raising your kids. And when you have, what do you need to do? You need to make amends. You need to go with a sincere apology. You need to, to change that kind of behavior and so on for sure, but you need to apologize for what you've done. There are some situations where it might be unloving, however. If there's this thing that had gone on between you and an old girlfriend and now she's moved on and she's married to somebody else, it's probably not the best thing for you to walk into her home someday and bring all this stuff up of something that happened in the past. Do you understand what I'm saying? That would be an unkind thing to do. That may do something for you, but it may do something negative for them. And you need to think it through and ask yourself, is it really appropriate for me to do this? Or do I just need to pull up the empty chair in this case and deal with that thing in my life and deal with it in that way? Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 says this, If it is possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That's God's call. That's God's claim upon our life. Then I want to encourage you, and I'm finished with this. Refocus your life. Refocus your life. On what? On doing God's will. On walking worthy of His name. In walking in obedience to the Lord. Start doing God's will in my relationships. 
in my relationship with my wife, in my relationship with my children, my relationship with my grandchildren, my relationship with my fellow workers. You, know, you get the idea, right? In your relationships, start to do the right thing. I want to uh, just pull out one passage of Scripture and read it for you here. It's in the book of Job, chapter 11. And down in verse 13, it says this, If you would prepare your heart... What have we been talking about tonight? We've been talking about you preparing your heart to forgive another, and in other cases to make amends where you've wronged other people. Prepare your heart. There's a, another Old Testament verse that always comes to my mind when I read this, and it's a verse that says this, Dear God, unite my heart. Because your heart's all over here. One part's here and here and here and here. Lord, unite my heart, what? To focus on you. And be obedient to you in these situations of my life. He says, if you would prepare your heart, and listen, and stretch out your hands towards him. And when it talks about stretching out your hands towards him, it's talking about God. Stretch out your hands towards the Lord. If iniquity in when you're, were in your hand, and you put it far away, and would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, then surely you could lift up your face without spot. So you see this iniquity that's in your life. You've wronged somebody. You've hurt somebody. And what are you going to do? You want to put it away. You want to make amends. And he says, what happens here when we're willing to do that? Then surely you could lift up your face without spot. You know what it will do? It'll free you in your prayer life to lift up your heart and your face before God and say, Lord, I need your blessing. I want you to work in my family. I need your strength in my relationships of my life. I, I want to walk with you. I want to live for you. And he tells us that that will do something tremendous in your life. You can lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and without fear. You don't have to worry that somewhere down the road, what you did wrong to somebody is going to come back and bite you. That at the most inopportune moment, they're going to decide to get their little bit of revenge that they've been stewing on because you never asked for forgiveness. And you make amends so that what? It doesn't come back to hurt you in the end. That's what he's telling here in, in the book of Job. He says, because, because you would forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed away. Waters that have passed away. We have a little phrase about that, don't we? What do we say? It's water under the bridge. It's biblical. There's some things in life that you need to be let be what? Let be water under the bridge. Let it go. You need to forgive. There's some things that you need to ask other people to let it be water under the bridge and to forgive you so that it's not there constantly causing problems in your relationships and hurting you in your walk with God. What do we need to do tonight in the light of what we've done in this message? By the way, the message title there, Maintain Momentum, that's going to be next Sunday night now because we're not even going to get to that one. I just finished up the old one. Just two things. Is there anybody I need to what? Forgive. Is there anybody I need to make amends to and get things right in my relationships with people in my life? And when we do that, what's he tell us? It has a freeing effect on us spiritually in our lives and in our walk with God. So I want to encourage you tonight. Give it over to the Lord. Let him work mightily in you and in your heart.